Um, one of the few rules within this area is that ethics boards vary a lot from ethics board to ethics board with respect to considerations. And the standards are different. Those standards are changing over time with respect to attitudes towards these sort of studies. Um, but not always in a way that um, uh, makes them more open to them. Um, uh, the concerns differ. Um, the uh, level of familiarity with the questions differ. Uh, and uh, I find that we are addressing different needs over time than we did, say, five years ago. Um, so there's a set of issues here that I'd, I'd like to uh, speak about. Um, some of the major ones uh, are listed here. Um, first is, is that variability. Um, uh, when it comes to network recruitment, I'll talk a little bit about snowball sampling and, uh, and res respondent-driven uh, designs for network-based recruitment. Suffice it to say that if you're recruiting in networks, say uh, you're recruiting egocentric networks, a person and several contacts within their network, as we've done for some studies. Or if, you're res or if you are engaged in recruitment, say, um, uh, in a, a school context or in a professional context where you're engaged in snowball sampling, successively reaching out to network contacts, um, this does require uh, blinded referrals. While well, technologically it would be very straightforward to, um, for us to follow up with contacts uh, directly, that ethics boards are often uncomfortable with names being given to us as the study um, designers and uh, the study administrators that include names of people who haven't yet agreed to be part of the study or contact information for them. And so whilst it would be straightforward from a, a technologic standpoint to be given email addresses which we could then email and, and say that, you know, a, a friend refer you to our study, this is information about the study, would you like to opt in? A lot of the time we're told that, that that's off the table. Um, we can't do that because it would involve advancing uh, information email addresses, say, for people who are, who have not yet elected to, to offer it. It's through their, through their contacts. Um, a third, uh, so I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit. A third issue is um, collectively identifiable information. Um, the, the observation from uh, ethics boards and others, uh, expert observers here, is that while any one data source collected by Ethica uh, for example, might have um, limited potential for identifiability. It, um, it has um, some potential for capturing certain aspects of, the, uh, of a person's uh, identity. Collectively, if you triangulate between these different components uh, from information about contact patterns, information about location, information related to the baseline surveys that they answered, it may be possible to identify from this set of different um, material. And um, much of the um, discomfort or um, concerns that I hear within the, uh, the ethics context relate to navigating this issue of, uh, you know, is this identifying not um, in any one piece, but is it identifying in toto? Um, an important question, and one that um, has been brought to us as, as questions about our, our study. Um, another, two, two related issues are aspects of, of notifiable behavior. Um, so if an individual is expressing suicidal ideation, for example, or, or expresses concerns about bullying or harassment, what are our ethical obligations for responding to that situation. We've had a number of studies which we've run related to suicidal ideation. Um, those studies benefited in, some, in a subset of cases, such as those worked on by Tina, because they were conducted within institutional contexts 
where care was already being delivered for these individuals. And therefore, um, there was a, an assumption that uh, suicidal ideation was part of, of their, um, their, their clinical, uh, the clinical, um, uh, clinical involvement of the, um, of the professionals and, uh, and that therefore it was to be assumed. Uh, you know, the, the issue grows more concerned yet when you're dealing with individuals in the community. Um, and, uh, and there's a question about response and there's a question about whether an individual in the study might reach out to us in hopes of securing help, but with the misunderstanding that we will be monitoring their, um, their, their cries for help on an ongoing basis where in fact it's episodic or you know only months afterwards. So a certain amount of consent education relates to this and relates to the fact for example helping them educate them that we will not be examining this sort of data until their time in the study is finished. Um, so they don't, um, th they don't have that sense that they can reach out to us as a lifeline, they, they're not encumbered by the belief that Ethica instantly transmits the data in all circumstances, which may not be true because of lack of network connectivity, et cetera. Law-breaking activities is another point of concern. What if um, one of our participants is witness to or in some sense potentially involved in law-breaking activities? Um, Maybe they are witness to a bank robbery, and there is a court of law that subpoenas our records involving their data. What is our ethical obligation? What is our legal obligation as far as providing this data, which was promised to be in confidence to the participant for to lawmakers or to, to law enforcement personnel? Um, so law breaking activities um, are a case where there may be subpoenas records, and it may sound far fetched, but you know um, when you're dealing with low RCP populations who live closer to the edge, um, we have had cases where there are family members who are uncomfortable with their spouse being part of the study because um, uh, potentially there's activities that they don't want to necessarily be caught. Um, we had one study participant in Virginia for a study that involved homeless and um, uh, indigent individuals where um, their phone was lost because it was in a car that they had to flee um, because of police presence. So they had to flee, there were drugs in the car, they left their phone in the car as part of it, <coughs> and we were unable to, to continue to involve them in the study. In that case, potentially, the GPS trace on that phone might have been sought you know, by, by police as to where they had come from, who they visited with respect to the drugs. It's never happened um, for us, but it could. And uh, we've been assured by institutional parties that this is defended within Canada, that our institutions will go to court to us uh, for us and basically um, uh, argue that uh, we are not obligated to provide data. Smartphone use and vehicles, this comes up quite a bit. I think Cheryl's seen this quite a bit. Um, institutional review boards want us to communicate to people in no event are, is a driver to respond to an Ethica questionnaire whilst driving. Um, which you know, it stands to reason, but they want that in plain language and in, um, and in um, potentially boldface within, you know, within consent forms to make sure that no one out of a misbegotten sense of study obligation picks up that phone in a way that, that could put their, risk, their life or the life of others at risk. Another case is audiovisual recording of, of people or voices that could be identified. So um, in one study for the study in Virginia, which involved uh, many homeless people, um, as well as many lower income people and, and some higher income people, um, um, 
Uh, it was a study of HIV positive individuals. And one of the things we asked was taking a photo of their pharmaceuticals, uh, so their, their heart regimen, um, their highly, uh, highly active antiretrovirals, which is so important for keeping their viral load level low and uh, lowering uh, both their clinical rate of clinical progression and the risk to others through sexual uh, contact or by needle sharing and other mechanisms, um, other pathways. And one of the concerns here was make sure those photos have no chance of showing, for example, when taking their pills, some information on the pill bottle that says who they are, um, you know, by showing their prescription number or their address or their name. And you also don't want that photo to show someone in the background that, that didn't agree to it, right? Um, same thing with audio recording. We don't want to have audio recorded that might include someone's voice that we say, we know that person, that's Nate. You know, and, and he stands exposed, you know, um, because of this. So, so audio could, in principle, capture someone, and video most certainly could, right? Uh, video of an event. So setting standards uh, for that and communicating those standards in consent forms. Um, Can I ask how you, yeah. as a practical matter, has that just been instructing participants yeah. to not capture those yes. types of things? Okay, so yeah, instructing both in person and in consent form in a written form, okay. helping, helping them understand that when it comes to audiovisual recording, there's gravity associated with it, that that although it may seem like a minor matter to snap a photo, in fact, they have to be careful um, to do so in a way that won't put themselves or others who aren't even part of the study at risk of, of being, um, uh, being shown you know, as, as, as uh, associated with um, behaviors or, or um, with, uh, uh, with uh, conditions like HIV which uh, might be um, of post privacy concerns. And so that involves education. And you'll see in some of the consent forms that I share with you some evidence of this. Um, uh, you know, a, a central area of ethics concerns relate to sensitive information being collected. And I would highlight um, particularly contact patterns geographic information, and any sort of medically significant information, so you know, conditions, diagnoses, treatments, et cetera. Um, and uh, you know, needless to say, HSINs or PHNs or you know, um, identifying numbers as part of the health system here in Canada or probably for HMOs, you know, identifying numbers in the, in the states. So, so medical information is, um, has extra levels of concern associated with HIPAA, uh, the Health Information Privacy Protection Act, and with its equivalent in, or its cognate in Canada, CAPETA. And this is something Ethic has had to, to go through is, is um, a level of, of certification as to compliance with uh, processes involved in, in maintaining um, medical information. Um, and then um, uh, certain, certain types of studies um, related to these have, have uh, a high degree of, of, of scrutiny. Now, associated with this is, um, I should have put here, and I'm, I'm not sure why it's not, there's almost always questions about a couple of things. And I may, I may maybe I, um, I uh, hit a slide that I should have uh, put there, but I'll make sure that this is, is down when I uh, post the final version of these slides. Um, almost always we get questions and reasonable questions about where data is stored, including nationally. Does the data live in Canada, or does it live in Australia for an Australia study? Is data uh, collected by Alberta Health Services stored in Alberta, or is it in Saskatchewan? Um, is it stored by any chance in the US, in which case it's subject to the Patriot Act? 
um, is the data transmitted from channels that it could include the US. Um, there's a lot of concern outside the US and the part of Canadian and Australian authorities and maybe, maybe also in Europe. Mohammed's dealt more with clients in Europe. But just wanting to be sure that data um, is not subject to Patriot Act, um, so pe uh, peering from, from our US neighbors. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's a recurrent question. Another question that comes up is um, uh, encryption. Um, uh, so how is the data stored on the phone? How is the data transmitted from the phone to Ethica servers? Uh, and uh, once on the servers, where is it physically located? Um, and how is it protected? Um, to what degree is it exposed to hackers? Those are almost always questions which uh, are, are typically, very commonly those come up. Um, and Mohammed could comment on you know, the encryption side of this, but it's encrypted on the device and it's encrypted in transit which generally makes the, the ethics boards uh, more comfortable with that. Um, uh, so if the phone is stolen, you know, it'll be, it'll be gibberish to someone who breaks in and, and tries to look at, at the data. Um, so those are some recurrent considerations that come up. There's a set of studies that are particularly sensitive. Um, these include intervention studies, uh, studies that involve potentially identifying information, um, uh, studies involving uh, special populations that are vulnerable to stigma and to, um, uh, to, uh, to discrimination. Um, so this might be uh, people living with HIV AIDS. Uh, it could involve uh, individuals who um, are, are, are a vulnerable group, uh, such as transgendered individuals. It could also involve individuals who are um, who have a history of past trauma or other abuse that may um, that they may not want to share, w you know, with with everyone who have a history of, of say drug abuse, uh, even though they're now clean, they they don't want um, history information to be to be shared. Um, um, uh, and you know, uh, those involving patient medical information. And, and those involving explicitly charts or health records or external databases, uh, you know, undergo uh, particular scrutiny. A lot of our studies that we work with health information, we do so um, not with that information inside of Ethica. Rather, we take Ethica data and we, we, we reach out to it and link it through external frameworks like R or SAS, or, or tools like Spark or Python, and we link it up with these medical data. The medical data are not put into Ethica so much as Ethica data is linked externally with, with, um, with that medical data. And that's uh, often a, you know, a position of greater comfort for institutional review boards. Okay? So that's how we've tended to deal with these matters but to the degree that, um, that there is an inpatient use of Ethica, for example, to capture um, medical information, it, it raises uh, additional questions on the part of institutional review boards that need to be, um, that need to be addressed. Um, okay, so a few tips here, and, and I have a bunch more uh, comments. So number one, engage early, often, and build relationships with your REB or, or IRB. Um, so before we started building Ethica's predecessor, while well, Ethica was still a speck in the cosmic eye, we uh, went to our, our research ethics board um, here on campus. We went to actually representatives of the biomedical and the behavioral, and we sat down with them and we said, look, this is what we can do technically. This is what some other people are doing elsewhere, and there were you know, maybe two or three projects worldwide on this right, right then. One out of Cambridge, one out of MIT. And, and we said, help us navigate this ethically. And that set the groundwork for a very productive relationship that lasted till about last year when the board turned over and the study coordinators <laughs> left. And, and now, now we're kind of back to building relationships. Um, so, um, uh, 
this helps a lot to have ongoing understanding and a point of contact with the with the ethics board. Um, you know, it'll help a lot also to have the IRBs and, and RBs to be pointed towards precedent. They're trying to, our, my observation is they're tr that many are trying to navigate the same, um, the same area. They're trying to figure out what are our obligations in this new era of data collection and pointing them to published work, pointing them to precedent in, as far as past studies. Um, the many ethics boards outside the U of S who have passed off on this work, um, you know, uh, Columbia, Michigan, Harvard, etc. Th um, these are these are um, uh, are places that have given it close consideration, and, and sometimes it helps bring along the ethics board to understand that this has been seriously examined. Um, one could also point to end user license agreements, uh, the ULAs, um, which are. Um, uh, which are not meaningful consent, um, uh, consent seeking uh, instruments that are commonly used to collect data on phones for commercial purposes and where the sorts of work we're doing is minimal risk compared to the sort of work, uh, the sort of, um, uh, sort of data that's collected in your end, license, end user license agreement. So the point is, there's a lot of this data being collected. We're going the extra mile in terms of trying to handle it with, with uh, in an ethically forward fashion. Um, uh, so consent form, uh, legal obligations with subpoenas, um, you know, warning in the consent form about this or noting how it will be handled is important. We again have gotten strong consideration that at least for us, the lawyers stand behind us in terms of keeping that data secret and that within Canada, that has never been successfully challenged by law enforcement personnel. That this data has a privileged position and it's a position that reflects um, many lines of research, say work with commercial sex workers where um, you know, the individuals are in a position of being at risk of law enforcement and and uh, are on the uh, you know sometimes on the wrong side of the law but that is protected by by the bond of, of researcher um, privilege and confidentiality um, is what we're, we're told here in Canada is very solid I can't speak to the situation in the states because I don't I don't know it with such clarity but I am reassured in the Canadian context. Um, um, so one thing we've done to very good effect is link to REBs to REBs. It's said in policing, police share with police, and REBs share with REBs. So we have found uh, linking up REBs with a corresponding person at another institution who's worked with this system before or, or has, has come to a a degree of understanding of what the real issues is, is is quite helpful. We have a set of documentation that I will be providing to you um, that's background information, but Mohammed has a better set yet. What is on the Ethica website is nothing in my mind short of remarkable in terms of documentation. There's an Ethica forum and sort of aimed at a community site. There's Ethica documentation, there's tutorials. And there's a section of the Ethica site that provides background information on Ethica in some detail, which can be very useful for REBs uh, and IRBs, um, using the sort of US side Canadian uh, designation. Um, we have other documentation on background and smartphone based data collection and Ethica in particular that's a bit older. I'm glad to provide all that with you, but Mohammed's collection is I think the highest quality and the most current. And my hat is off to him, um, as in so many things. Uh, it's really remarkable. And uh, I will mention, um, if any of you are seeking uh, clarification on issues with, with Ethica, please be encouraged to post in the forum. Please be encouraged to reach out on the website. My students have told me, my colleagues have told me um, how, how, uh, just how quickly they get answers there. Um, and, and that again is, is, is uh, a great testimony to Mohammed's uh, care. Um, use pilot and feasibility studies first. Try things small and contained uh, to get going. Um, learn from an early study 
uh, and it helps the granting process. It helps the, the uh, getting the IRB uh, on board. It helps in terms of um, some of the, 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 you know, the, the judicious planning for the larger study. Um, I will tell you, we have had, when it comes to IRB and REBs, we've had one very bad experience with a feasibility study. Um, uh, the feasibility study went great, but I had a very bad experience with an REB. Basically, we had a feasibility study which took enormous effort to pull together because it was the one with uh, homeless individuals, with individuals who are lower income. Um, we had issues, you know, very disordered individuals uh, struggling with uh, heroin addiction, et cetera, carrying the phones. And it was a feasibility study um, that was designed to, to inform us to scale up. But it's intensively longitudinally um, dense information. And we were interested in knowing about the day-to-day -day texture of the lives of these individuals. What they were reporting, for example, about their challenges being able to take their medication every day, their heart, heart uh, medication that's so critical for their health progress. And uh, essentially, our, our, the REB involved, which was not ours here, it was another one, banned us from looking at the data. They said, this is a feasibility study. You're not allowed to look at anything except feasibility um, criteria. So uh, you're not, they said it's scientifically improper for you to look at the data because the sample size is too small. And, and it was like, OK, so you're telling us if we have 1,000 records from this, which is actually high hundreds, so maybe it's 900 surveys answered by some participants, 800 by others, 600. And they said, OK, you're not allowed to look at that because you don't have enough, you don't have enough participants to be a representative sample of the population. Sorry, you know, HIV-infected individuals are also not a representative sample of the population. And they, they overstepped their grounds. But we swallowed and we said, OK, it took us you know, half a year to negotiate it. We said, OK, fine, we won't look at that data. Just let us run the study. And they did let us run the study. And it was just one bad experience. Um, OK, uh, be patient, though. Uh, they learn over time. Um, I would say err on the side of complying with concerns. I did it. We may reexamine the issue. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, sometimes they overstep their grounds and you go through the work and then maybe you can build their comfort level so they'll actually let you look at the data that was collected. Can you sue them? Sorry? Can you sue them? <laughs> this, this is Canada. Um, <laughs> I know in the US even like presidents sue like news outlets, but <laughs> welcome the true north, strong and free. Um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> we should talk. Um, no, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll bring them along. I'm, I'm convinced. Um, uh, in any case, uh, moving right along. Um, uh, so address specific worries. There are specific worries about driving, audiovisual recording, showing individual data. That, that do need to be addressed. And these things can be addressed rather readily. And once you address them in one study, you can reuse that. We find ourselves reusing a lot of the text from one study to, a next, to the next. So um, you know, it's not like you go through this work and you have to start all over at the beginning again. You can often end up um, uh, securing you know, a strong asset by going through it, uh, going through it once um, and, and then continuing to use it. Um, one form that we have found very helpful is to have tiered opt-in. And uh, um, you may think I'm referring to like weeping tears, but no, I, I'm actually, our, our experience with RBs has been by and large very good, I, I have to say. Our RB here has been excellent um, over, over the years. And by and large, we've had little problem with others, with a couple exceptions, um, which I could mention. If, if people are interested. But, um, but opt-in strategies for tiered consent is something that, that um, has this nice feel to it. It's almost like a contingent contract in the sense that it helps address risk concerns on both sides. See, the idea here is that people can opt into the study at different levels of consent or provision. 
So some, some people might want to opt in only with the guarantees that their data will never be examined at an individual level. Others will opt in with the understanding that their data will never be published at an individual level or shared. It will never be you know, shown at an individual level. It would only be shown together with others, but it could be examined. It's just that statistics that are shared externally would need to involve them and others. Um, others yet might say, look, um, you know, um, you, you know I, I have no real concerns here. I'm willing to allow my data for the sake of a publication or what have you to be used as an example in a de-identified way, in a way without my name, and maybe it's no geographic information and no information about particular dates. It could be shown there. And someone else might say, well, look, you know, um, you could show all but um, the ge geographic um, locations of things. So these are what I call tiered opt-in. Some might opt in to different levels of that. It's a bit more work for the researcher, but it might allow recruiting people who otherwise wouldn't join. And it might allow the REB to be comfortable with it um, because they say, you know, you can let, um, you can let participants address their particular risk level, uh, risk comfort levels according to their risk preferences. So this is a strategy we have used. Um, it's been quite successful. In other cases, I believe uh, a study with Cheryl, um, uh, for example, uh, my, my recollection, I could be off, was that, um, you know, there, we didn't, w within the uh, ethics submission, we did not seek the uh, ability to summarize uh, information or, or share it publicly at an individual level. So it's just across the board, it was aggregate, aggregate promises. This is important. Um, it's important to assure, of course, the RB, you're working with de-identified data, data from which names and, and addresses and birth dates and so on have been stripped. But more than that, in terms of the communication, the dissemination of it, you want to be, want to be clear. Um, and then providing background information on Ethica is, is key, and Ethica um, provides a lot of backup for that. Okay, so some points of discussion with IRBs. Um, there's a set of repeated issues that come back. One is, is the encryption thing, and again, I don't know why it's not here, um, but the fact that Ethica encrypts on device and in transit when sending the information. Um, Another thing is, for a lot of studies, what you're collecting um, is much of it is in the public sphere. Um, you know, people's um, uh, people's patterns of, uh, of of physical activity in a work environment, or or people's movement within um, within a uh, within a building or within a certain geographical area. There's a lot of information that Ethica collects that's kind of in the public forum. Um, and that sort of information needs to be highlighted to the REB. It's not like you know, we are collecting people's um, you know, uh, innermost thoughts on an ongoing basis, or we're collecting their, um, uh, their, their stress hormone levels every three minutes or something like that. Um, uh, we are collecting a lot, of, a lot of data about someone's location or aspects of who they're with or their level of sedentary behavior that um, in many cases is visible to others most of the time anyway. Um, there's a consent process that's absolutely essential <coughs> and it's very important that REBs realize that while this sort of information is collected by numerous commercial actors, um, through different means than Ethica. Ethica is, is, is a uh, system which works hand in hand to secure consent, informed consent from individuals which is lacking for the many, many collectors of this information um, that operate on smartphones routinely. Apple, Google, Facebook, et cetera. Just collecting gobs of information. We at least go through a meaningful consent process where we're very clear about what data were provided and we allow them to pause 
right? And we saw this yesterday. Pause, pressing that pause button can stop all data collection through those automatic mechanisms for a defined time. Alternatively, they can disable. For many studies where you make it optional, they can disable in the app, say GPS, or disable uh, step counts, um, disable uh, the records for Bluetooth contacts. In other cases, well, look, on their phone, they can turn off GPS, and Ethica doesn't have access to GPS. So there's multiple levels of opting out. And Ethica, um, as an interface, tries to make it very easy for someone to request privacy. We, we built that into our systems from the first, and it bears noting that from a participant recruitment standpoint, that raises confidence and trust with, with participants, right? That they can opt out at any time. If they want a time where they have, want privacy, they can be guaranteed privacy for a period of time. And that's respectful. It's, re it's, it's respecting them as persons, right? Um, uh, but it also, um, is something which is helpful to know. In Ethica, it does record during this period of time the data was absent because it was requested, you know, for, for sens censoring was requested for this period of time. So it's distinct from just, it's no data is my understanding. Am I right about that, Mohammed? So when someone pauses for a time, yeah. that's distinct from the data is just gone. Like they turn off their phone for a certain amount yeah. of time. So, so we know the phone was on, but they requested it. One sobering thing I will share with people, there's only one study that we've ever run which has involved quite a few participants opting out explicitly, okay? Actually, actively choosing to mask the data collection. That was a study involving lower income participants uh, where we handed out Data. This is pre-Ethica. This is goes back to 2010 or 2000, uh, 2000, 2012, maybe um, 2013. Um, we we handed out phones. It was predominantly a lower income group, um, uh, and there were. This was a concern. It was it was a study entirely with women um, as the participants. It was for gestational diabetes, um, and it was a clinically recruited group. And a number of family members of these predominantly lower SES women, lower socioeconomic position women, um, some family members uh, expressed concern about um, uh, data collection. And in other cases, uh, the women decided to, to you know, pause data collection. So we actually had quite a bit of data that was, um, was deliberately requested for being censored. Uh, we, it was not collected. Uh, and I felt very proud that we could, we could secure their trust um, that to the level that they could request it with confidence that we would observe it, and indeed we did. Um, I've never really found it a big problem for analysis. This was a study Alan was involved in it uh, back there, um, the GDM study. Um, uh, and um, I, would, I would note there's a lot of, you know, this sort of information that's collected by, by commercial um, commercial uh, actors. Um, so I mentioned different options for opting out of studies. Um, one one um, type of arrangement that we are, we, I've long considered as attractive, but we have yet to really act on, is what I like to call data escrow based studies. The idea here is look, you collect data from a set of participants but you do so with the understanding that data will only be used under certain circumstances. So, for example, in the event of a, a positive outcome for their disease prognosis or, or negative outcome, in the event of a public health emergency or, or some sort of, um, you know, an outbreak, for example, um, we will use their, their retroactively provided data um, Otherwise, that data is tossed. That data is discarded. The idea here is that the data is not used most of the time. It's only used in the event that there's a strong need to do so, uh, say, for health authorities. Um, and uh, 
It may be that larger so superset of data is provided, say um, uh, geographic patterns and contact patterns um, for use only in those circumstances, and otherwise the data is restricted to self-report and uh, you know step counts or what have you. Um, uh, so this is sort of contingent data collection. Um, it's not so applicable for most research studies, but when it comes to um, health system use, it offers a, uh, uh, a particular place that it, it might offer. So those were some, again, I kept my comments here in an abbreviated fashion. I've tried to share with you some tips, pointers, suggestions, um, observations. Uh, I would say that by and large, it has, it has been a quite good journey with REB boards and IRBs, but it's a journey with uh, highly variegated experiences and with ups and downs and with very non-monotonic um, progression. In other words, it doesn't just get better each successive year, it changes. Mohammed, if you are interested, could probably talk with you about uh, European standards, the, uh, GDPR. the GDPR uh, for data protection within Europe, um, and, uh, and how that enters into uh, this picture. It has, um, it has required Ethica to accommodate it, and um, Ethica is used successfully in a number of European countries, I think most notably in um, Netherlands, Switzerland, and UK, yes. and UK um, as as well. Um, I think UK is still part of Europe. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So, um, what a weird world we live in. Um, so, in any case, um, that's that's a little bit on the human ethics side. Okay. Um, uh, the plan is for me to continue on to talk about recruitment. But if possible, to pause for uh, refreshments. Are those refreshments yet here? The refreshments have arrived. Okay, together the, with them, the cavalry. So um, I will um, uh, I will break now, and we'll resume in, in um, another ten to fifteen minutes uh, with some comments on participant recruitment. Okay, and then we'll dive in to the projects again. Okay. Thank you very much. And TAs, thank you for coming over. Cavalry indeed. <laughs>